All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode. That's right, the London is Blue podcast. Hopefully your favorite Chelsea podcast out there. Look, we're here when it's sunny times, and we're here when it's rainy times, and we're here when it's times Chelsea may be walking through an absolute eye of the hurricane. But Sam, you joining me, Dan, on this episode to do a little bit of a match preview for the weekend's upcoming match where Chelsea are going to take on Sheffield United and attempt to rebound a little bit bring back some winning form, hopefully, fingers crossed, and trying to get supporters maybe a little bit back on the side of the club, the manager, and the players, because it doesn't feel great at the moment, and there's not a lot of Yuletide or season's greetings that are being given or provided to this Chelsea contingent at the moment, but hopefully this is the match, this is the game, where Chelsea can kick off a run of five matches over the next 14 days to see if we can get some cheer ahead of the new year. No, you're absolutely right. And I think we have to put straight a record. We haven't had uh, good games against sides that end with the name United. So I think that this is a very good opportunity to change it and start (laughs) maybe turning a corner and doing something good for our season. So probably presents a very interesting opportunity. Like you said, you know, festive season, 10 days away. If there's anything that Chelsea can do to make things better and lift spirits, oh my God, this would be just the way to begin. So looking forward to it, I think that is, um, we all know the quality of the opposition and then how they've been doing, but an interesting twist in the tale recently. So um, ones that that we are usually very cautious of. So yeah, hopefully we can navigate that and uh, actually give ourselves a reason to believe again in terms of how we want this season to go. Well, yeah, again, belief is going to be extremely important in this side, believing in themselves, supporters believing them, the owners believing in the manager, the manager believing in his team and his side. And hopefully that can all be accomplished again with a win over Sheffield United. And you know what we do in a match preview. We're going to go down what their current results are, anything that is pertinent maybe new changes particularly around the manager position for Sheffield United that have occurred recently we'll talk about how they've been playing for those who don't remember or haven't had time to watch Sheffield United uh surprise they are much worse than Chelsea at least on a form and table perspective we'll also go through where are the weaknesses how can Chelsea potentially hurt them what are the problems that Pochettino has to solve things that are injury related rotation related for him and then we'll also try to get a little bit of prediction going with a predicted starting lineup and then also score predictions and hopefully our predictions involve a chelsea win and they do come true that would just be the absolute best but before we do that we just want to say thanks to everybody supporting the podcast we appreciate all of you particularly in this time of year sharing the spotify raps they're fantastic Leave five star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Also, super appreciate helps people sh- find the show, and we're super appreciative for that. We definitely would recommend doing that. If you got a second during this holiday season as you're commuting to and fro, we'd also like you to join us on YouTube. You can hit the subscribe button on the channel, and you also can hit the bell icon to get notified when we drop videos there. And then you also can sign up for our wonderful free newsletter that Sam writes every single week. This one, an absolute banger. You're not getting in your inbox for free if you're not subscribed, so you want to do that too. And then also you can join the conversation Discord. It's also a way to help support the podcast with a couple of dollars. But again, you don't have to do that. We just think it's a great community. All links in the description or in the show notes if you want to get involved in any single way there. But that's going to do it for the admin because we're going to take a look at Sheffield United, the deep examination on how they're performing. And Sam, I don't think we can start in our typical way because we have to talk about the fact that Chris Wilder, dismissed on the 13th of March, 2021, has made a return to Sheffield United. And that's after uh, the interim, Paul Heckenbottom, who took over for 11 matches and then uh, a name that some Chelsea fans may know in uh, Slav- uh, Slavisa Djakonovic, who played for us for about two seasons, ended up taking over a, for 22 matches before being replaced in a permanent capacity by Paul Heckenbottom from the 25th of November 2021 up until December 5th, 2023. He got an early start on a Christmas vacation from football after he was dismissed from duties at the terrible 
with the terrible start that Sheffield United had. And they return to their old flame, Chris Wilder, who's now had two matches with a win and a loss. Yeah, it's quite ironic that they actually fired their manager when they were at the hecking bottom of the table, weren't they? So, um, yeah, good to see that they've gone back to to Wilder, who apparently had some, not apparently, I mean, we all saw what he did in his um, first spell, some very interesting tactical things in terms of overlapping fullbacks, sorry, overlapping centre-backs that became a little bit of a talking point when when he was around. So um, we will talk about it, we will examine forensically what his impact has been. It's only been two games, but it already looks like there's an upturn in performances, in the numbers. But overall, it's just been an incredibly poor season for them. They just rock bottom on on everything that you could possibly imagine. And uh, yeah, I think it'll it'll require a Christmas miracle for them to, to make it out of here alive and have a Premier League career at the end of this one. Yeah, it does not look likely for Sheffield United. And so let's me run through how they're doing at the moment. Again, they are occupying the very, very bottom spot at the table after 16 matches played. Look, they are sharing the same number of points at Burnley, who are one place ahead of them, a 19th club table. That's because they have a whopping negative 29 goal difference. Burnley is at negative 18, so... 11, 11 goals better, but Sheffield, absolutely one of the worst campaigns in the modern Premier League era. You know, the, you look at their record, it's 2-2-12, two, two, the eight points. They're averaging 0. 0.5 points a game. They are home record 2-1-6 with seven points, away record 0-1-6 with one point. They are averaging under a goal a game with 12 total goals this season, season 0.75 goals against that 41. And then their expected goals, they're kind of right on target there at 12.6. Their expected goals allow, actually, this is where there's a massive difference at 33.2 expected allowed to the 41 that they have let in. And I think that tells, I mean, at least is the right type of headline for this team, Sam, is that they have not found any good fortune even when they're they're not scoring a ton but they are just conceding an absolutely ridiculous number of goals over the course of the season. I think they began in acrimonious circumstances with that 8-0 loss to Newcastle. I think sure. people just knew that they were going to struggle from from the off but when a statement result like that happens early on in the season that's when you know everything's against you. You tend to fear about long-term consequences, and I think that just was the defining moment. And and to have it that early just flipped the tables on them. And uh, since then, it's just been plunging down the bottom. Like you mentioned, one of the worst campaigns maybe in living memory. They only have two wins: one against Wolves, and the one the one the other one that they had was the last game against Brentford. So. Um, not good. Like I mentioned, everything, even if I look at the numbers and say, okay, what is it that can be, can be turned around? It just looks, it just looks horrible from every single perspective. It just looks like you're trying to, you know, um, rejuvenate a a dead horse. And unless, you know, you have necromancer powers, I don't think you're able to going to get anything out of this, but you know, Chris Wilder has done a very good job. He knows a lot of the players that are at the club in the squad from his first stint. So having a familiar face around, having somebody who knows the club, knows the fans, I think is also a feel-good kind of appointment, the way that we made with Frank Lampard when things are going extremely wrong for us. And I think it, it may be just, you know, beyond them. I don't think anybody wants to believe it with half the season gone because there's a long way to go. But I think it's also maybe eventually preparing for if they do drop down, then then they have a person that they know well and then maybe can get them back up again. So, yeah, apart from that, I think it's just trying to figure out how they're going to play against us because it's just been two games. We don't have a big sample size, but uh, it's tough when you come up against a side that you see a slight upturn in, you're trying to predict where they go next. I think as somebody who does these preview boards, it's the hardest thing to do to to try and predict how they go from what made them so bad to what could make them better. 
Well, again, it will be the first time that Chelsea are taking on Sheffield United since March 21st, 2021. That was an FA Cup match that Chelsea won 2 to nothing. And then that season, their last season in the Premier League before their return in this season, Chelsea did the double over them, a 4-1 win at home and a 2-1 win away that season. Last time that they beat Chelsea was the prior season with a July 11th uh, victory, uh, 3-0. Um, that was quite a bit of a doozy for Chelsea to go up and uh, not not win. I mean, that was with uh, McGoldrick's double and McBurney's single to get them ahead versus Frank Lampard. So ultimately, not a lot of recent history amongst these sides, Sam, but I mean, there is kind of a more longer standing you know, in terms of, you know, the number of matches played Chelsea, like historically 41 total wins over Sheffield all time, 16 drawn and 28 games lost. And in general, most of those losses uh, have occurred sporadically, but typically during the 20s and 30s and not necessarily the 2020s or 2030s because that would be the future but the 1900s so a little bit of ancient history as it comes to that there but there are thinking about modern history some key injuries to their side we'll get into our injuries or Chelsea's injuries when we talk about Posh's problems to solve but just looking at the players that Sheffield United have out I think there are some key men missing in Chris Waller's side that are going to maybe change or force his hand with who he might line up with or how they might have to play. Yeah, I think when I look at our side of the table, we look less like the Blues and more like the Red Cross. It's just been 12 players now, I think, who are doubtful or injured. And uh, I think both our fullbacks, first choice fullbacks, as well as Malo Gusto is doubtful. Kukureya had a twisted ankle. So we essentially have, you know, four fullbacks out of this game, which means that we have to revert to um, the four centre-back proposition, uh, which a lot of people don't like, but now it's just being played out of choice. So it's definitely going to be tough for Potts to rotate or consider the, what to fix and how when when he's got limited options to to make it happen, especially when he wants a small squad and for twenty five man squad, if twelve people are out injured or doubtful, that's half your squad gone and you you play eleven players a game. So I don't think people realize how difficult a job it has been for them since the start. But uh, yeah, I think for Sheffield United, it's been a bit of an issue because some of the senior players, the ones with Premier League experience, like Chris Basham, John Egan. Um, they've had like injury concerns. They've been out for a bit. Uh, Rian Brewster is somebody who's, I think, played for Liverpool earlier. So he's also out. He's also had starting games uh, at the beginning of the season. But after he got injured in, in one of the games, he sort of like been in and out or hasn't been in at all. Haven't seen him. Uh, they were missing Ollie McBurney for the last game because he was suspended. He has five yellows and and I think one red already this season so he's had a bit of a discipline issue but he's back for our game the big one missing for them is jack robinson who is uh, i think the second most used player in their squad after the goalkeeper so the most used outfielder and he's the centerpiece of their three-man defense so the central center back and uh, him missing out is arguably a, a huge huge hit uh, to their defensive chances of, of pulling anything off and um what I should stress is when you take over a team which struggles to score and struggles to do basic things like to win a game, the one thing that the manager looks to do is make you more compact, make you more harder to beat. And key to that is defensive organization. But if you lose the guy who is supposed to be the organizer and, and the voice there, then it makes it profoundly tough to execute. So I think that's what's going to happen with Jack Robinson not there. Um, I should add that the defense in terms of their aerial stuff is pretty good, but I think missing somebody who's going to give them guidance and direction, especially with guys like Anel Ahmed Hodzic, quite young and still acclimatizing to the Premier League, it's going to be it's going to be a tough, tough time for them. So as we kind of get into this one, you know, we're going to talk about the different styles of play and some of the weaknesses they have. We're going to take our first break real, real quick, and then we're going to get into just 
what Sheffield have been up to on the pitch, how they've been playing. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. What is going on, Chelsea fans? Exciting announcement. Uh, we have joined up with Team Manscaped again for this holiday season. That's right. We are back with Manscaped. I know how much you love their ads before, so we are going to partner up with them again this holiday season. If you're looking for a gift to upgrade your daily care routine, right? Check out the brand new Lawnmower 5.0 ultra that's right we got the the new one here so as you are used to uh with these trimmers it is skin safe technology we got the dual head system waterproof you can use it in the shower uh usb c quick charge option dual temp led spotlight and it's got a travel lock so the kit that we are recommending you get is the 5.0 ultra comes with the razor itself comes with two of the combs, and then it also comes with the foil blade. You've got all options here that comes with it. Now check this thing out. It is built great, nice and sturdy, good weight to it. You can hear, you got some good RPMs in there. Check out the light for those of you on YouTube. That's right, you got two different uh, brightnesses on there that you have. Uh, the other reason we love Manscaped is that uh, they are part of the Testicular Cancer Society, right? They save balls. They're all about helping men uh, with their daily grooming routines as well as what they're going through life. So we appreciate them and everything they do. Check it out. Again, Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Link in the description. Check it out. Link in the description. Let them know that you came to them through London is Blue so that they can continue a partnership with us. Check them out. All right, Sam, so run us through a little bit of an update on how Sheffield are playing. And I think it's going to be maybe a little tougher because people might have seen a couple of the games earlier in the season that Sheffield involved in, some of the really, really drastic results um, are dreadful and dra drastically dreadful results for Sheffield United. Uh, but now two matches in while they're back, is he reverting back to exactly what he would we would expect him to do with this side I think is the first question to answer and kind of going through what we then should expect from how he's going to set up his side in this match yeah, you set it up perfectly for me I think the large picture is that you know they've been absolutely woeful so when you look at their numbers rooted to the bottom of the Premier League worst attack with only 12 goals so far in 16 games, they've got the worst defense with 41. They've got the second worst average possession in the in the league with 37.9. And you can't say this respectfully to, to them because a lot of teams don't want to play with the ball. And that's perfectly all right. It's an entire entirely different school of thought. But it looks like, you know, they want the ball, but they can't get it. And when they have it, they know how to use it well. It, it's been that, I think, the tail of the tape since they've started playing Premier League football this season. It just pretty poor in terms of what they can do with possession. They've done uh, the most goals conceded from open play, 31, which is, uh, I think, six clear or seven clear of the second side. Uh, in that table, they have conceded the joint most from set pieces, which is seven goals. Their uh, underlying metrics, like I mentioned, are also very, very bad. They're worst for expected goals. They're joint worst for expected goals against. They're worst for shots taken per 90 minutes, which is just 8.38. Um, and after all of this, you know, manager Paul Hackenbottom, like you mentioned, was fired. And then Chris Wilder's come in. And, well, they have eight points and, and two wins from 15 games. And essentially, he has to try and get them to a safe spot from here. So it's pretty much an impossible heist. But what's been interesting for me to go back and see is, like you mentioned, has he changed, gone back to what he did uh, with his Sheffield United side earlier when they were in the Premier League? I would say some of the elements are still there. So the first thing, like I mentioned, he wants to do is to try and make them as hard as uh, possible to beat in terms of just figuring out how to keep the clean sheet, how to to minimize the goals that they've been leaking so the porous nature of the team is something that he's tried to tweak. Uh, he's used a 3-5-2 earlier in, in his first campaign. And Sheffield United have been playing a 3-4-3, a 3-4-1-2 with Hackenbottom as well. So what he's done, he's just continued it. And it's helped that the team is familiar with, with the formation and, and how it works. So the 3-4-1-2, the 3-5-2 is basically the system. Three centre-backs. Uh, then he's got wing-backs. One of them usually um, a, a 
wide midfielder who's converted. So Jaden Bogle, who plays uh, on the right hand side, is is somebody who's I would say not a defender, but he just adds a little bit of attacking thrust on the right hand side. And out of possession, what he's trying to do is again try to figure if he can put them in a four four two mid block and make them aggressive, not in the sense that ask them to press and do things that they're not familiar with in the attacking third, but just for them to sit back and see if they can hit you on the counter-attack and hit you on transition. And that's worked for them. So when I was watching uh, the Liverpool game, what they did was they tried not to press Liverpool too much. Obviously, you've got Alisson and you've got a lot of guys who are comfortable under pressure. So he just asked them to retreat to around the halfway line into a 4-4-2 or a 4-3-3. Um, people were being man-marked. Vinicius Souza, who's their defensive midfielder, was essentially patrolling the back line, making sure that nobody dropped into space. And from there, they were trying to win the ball back and, and try and counter-attack. So interestingly, they managed to nick the ball off Liverpool a couple of times, and most of them were concentration errors. So Konate, for example, just went to sleep and he was robbed and, and they broke basically 2v2. Um, and then I think Joe Gomez was robbed once uh, with nobody behind him and only Allison behind him. And it was a 1v1 chance and, and they scuffed it. And they essentially went on to have uh, three big chances. And then they missed all three of them as Liverpool went on to win 2-0. And I should add that Liverpool needed a set pieces set piece goal from, from Virgil van Dijk in the first half. And they didn't score their second goal until stoppage time in the second. So it was, you know, a, a far more uncomfortable win for Liverpool than the numbers suggest. So he's definitely had a good effect. He's had a galvanizing effect on how they organize themselves and, and how they're playing. And it's not as amorphous as the side looked. A lot of the times that I saw them against Newcastle, I couldn't tell what they were trying to do out of possession. It just looked like a couple of players had been bought from different parts of um, town and just asked to come and play together against a, a well-drilled side. They just looked all over the place. But it's a more cohesive side with a more coherent understanding of how they need to work together. And uh, I think that's something that, that stood out for me. They also did something interesting. They kept retreating into a 5-3-2, which you expect. But at times, they also went 6-2-2, with, which Unai Emery did with Aston Villa a couple of times. And they essentially had six players to, to deal with Liverpool's uh, wide players to make sure that they had enough players to counter their box occupation, the amount of players that they try and throw in against you inside the box. So ultra-defensive. Um, in certain phases and making sure that they dealt with you um, when you were trying to overload the box. So that's something that was interesting. The second game, they shifted to a slightly asymmetrical 4-1-4-1. So they had their uh, centre-backs in Robinson, like I mentioned. Uh, but Bogle, who I mentioned, was the wing-back in the back three, moved to full-back. So he was actually right back in this game. And um, on the left-backs uh, slot was essentially the Colville position. So they played a centre-back there. And uh, Aaron Trusty, who's an American centre-back, was basically playing there. And he was overlapping from the left-hand side as a centre-back, but at left-back position. Like, you often see Colville do sometimes, try and uh, go forward when he gets the opportunity. Trusty did that. And obviously, it allows them to go to a back three because they have three centre-backs. And Bogle was the more attacking full-back. So he was allowed to go on the right-hand side and push on. And um, I should add that um, Sheffield United, out of all sides in the Premier League, have the highest attacking bias on the right-hand side, 42%. And we are second with 41%. So it tells you how much of our attacks come through Sterling. The same way that a lot of their attacks will come through the right-hand side, where they've got James McAtee, where they've got Jaden Bogle, and even their asymmetrical side, the more defensive side is the left-hand left -hand side because they've got an extra CB there. And the right-hand side is a little more open, but more attacking. And this game, they essentially did much better than Liverpool. They were, again, extremely solid, um, well-organized. I would say in terms of how much space was there between lines. There's a huge difference between what I saw between Heckenbottom and what I saw against uh, uh, Brentford in the second game. A lot more compact. I think the team's still coming to grips with what is asked from them. But 
this was the first game in 16 games uh, that they've conceded less than 0.6 xg so it does suggest that they're getting better this was also the first game um, in which they registered 60 percent or higher aerial dual success win percentage and this was essentially the same players that Hackenbottom had. So you can see some improvement in some metrics. They're box defending. Um, and obviously, when you make the unit better, then the individuals feel more comfortable. And I think that's what Wilder has done. Um, an interesting stat is that uh, more than 25% of the big chances they've created in the entire season have come under Wilder in the last two games. And these two games were under uh, against Liverpool and Brentford. So. Um, still extremely dangerous because they're just coming up against um you know i think they've discovered a little bit of hope and that can be hope can be a very dangerous thing so yeah just have to be wary some of the things that they do can hurt you like for example that they've got uh a long throws from the attacking third into the box and um essentially they they target the six yard box from from the dutch line so um, something Rory Delap esque, not as flat, but you can see them do Brentford like stuff from from the Dutch line, which we'll have to be careful against. But that's essentially it. I think what we are going to discover is a side um, feeling a little bit optimistic, seeing better instructions, performing better as a unit, but also missing one of the key cogs in defense, uh, knowing that they are capable of. You know, once the floodgates open, things can go horribly bad. So they have a little bit of hidden trauma uh, with them. They're carrying it with them. And, you know, once you dig over the scabs, then you can, you know, reveal the wounds within. So I think that's what the the big question is. You know, how much damage can we, can we cause? And how much of it that Sheffield United are feeling under Wilder is long-term and more permanent? And can we burst that bubble quickly? You know, one of the things, for those who didn't read the newsletter that you did this week, you talked about the average age of Chelsea's side. And in looking at the Sheffield United, their starting 11 from their last match against Brentford, you know, so when you look at, and you contrast that to Chelsea's average age when we played our last match against Everton, which um, this is only the starting uh, lineup, was 236 uh, their total was 24.7. So it's actually a little, a little more proximity relative to that age within the starting lineup that might be, you know, some of the naivety of youth that is potentially being exposed in that regard in terms of being more of almost like a Premier League 2 plus plus team rather than being an actual Premier League side. And, you know, are you seeing that too as you look at maybe some of the weaknesses or opportunities that Chelsea might be able to exploit is that that this is also a less experienced Premier League side, both in terms of games played and age of the squad. Yeah, I think it's definitely hurt them that they're more experienced campaigners, the guys that know the Premier League and how brutal the league can get. I mentioned Basham, Egan, um, even Tom Davis, I think, plays for them, but he's not been available. Ryan Brewster... Um, George Bal Baldock, who's, uh, I think, doubtful for the game against us. All these guys have played played in the Premier League ahead. And then if you've got five players, uh, experienced campaigners, who might not start in and out, but at least are giving maybe Wilder a little bit of solidity. I think uh, a lot of the times I go back to the time when um, Tuchel's first game happened in a, and all of us were expecting Mount to start and, and you know, young players to come in. But the first thing Tuchel did was he benched everybody and he only kept the, the most senior players in that 0-0 against Wolves. And the message was clear. You know, I need leadership. I need guys who have the most experience to stand up because this is what is going to get us to the finish line. And he's missed that. I think, like you mentioned, naivety and maybe unfamiliarity with just the, the brutal shift that is there from the championship to the Premier League in terms of physicality, in terms of the quality of athletes and, and the intelligence of the players that you come up, come up against has, has hit them very hard. So, yeah, I think for us, it's been pretty much the same thing. We haven't come from the championship, but some players like Cole Palmer have come up from PL2. Um, and, you know, they've had 12 starts and it's it's 
sometimes surreal for us to even think that, you know, just because you wear the Chelsea shirt, you're not allowed to dip in form because you're 21 years old and you play for one of the biggest clubs in the world. They're still kids. And I think when you look at them, when you look at us, it has to be a mirror and, and tell yourself that, look, Jackson has 28 starts. Palmer has 12 starts. You know, these guys will have off days. Sometimes, most of the times together. And when two, three players, young players have off days, then the side looks bad sometimes for prolonged periods of time. So that's maybe what Wilder is missing. That's maybe what we are missing. You know, a little bit of experience, a little bit of, hey man, we just won nil down. Happens. Happens in the Premier League. No no problems. You know, we'll recover. That happens. I think both teams start doing better. Hopefully, we'll get ours back before they do. Fair. Fair. We, we definitely want our mojo to return before before theirs. So what are the other elements or areas you think Chelsea are going to be able to take advantage of? I mean, I think that they did not showcase an ability to be uh, very clinical in their last match against Brentford, even though they had less of the ball, but had the same number of shots on target for a piece relative there. There were only 19 shots total in that game. So not really a barn burner as it was, but I think there are other areas too, where maybe they're not uh, uh, as dominant in certain areas on the pitch as they should be. So w- what are you kind of highlighting as, Hey, if we're, if we're really happy at the end of this match, what have Chelsea taken advantage of? Yeah, I think the first point is the most important one. Uh, you know, despite Wilder coming in and making sure that they've created a majority of their chances in the last two games, the last the big chances in the last two games, um, you can't dispute the fact that this is a side that has the lowest big chances created with 19, and they've missed 16, which is quite the number. Uh, There's also no running away from the fact that they've only scored five open play goals. Two have come from set pieces, two from penalties, and they've, I think, got three own goals. So that essentially makes up the tally of 12. And five open play goals in 16 games is, is, yeah, it's dreadful. It's one open play goal every three games. So um, I think the big thing would be for us to capitalize on that against a side that's only taking eight and a half shots a game. If you can restrict them to, you know, peppering the goal from 20, 25 yards out and and harmless attempts that whoever our goalkeeper is, uh, is able to just comfortably deal with, I think then you stand a very good chance of at least getting a clean sheet. Let's start from there. You know, let's be defensively compact because I think in the last four games, five games, we've conceded two goals. So a clean sheet would be very good for us to start off with. So let's start off this round with making sure we are defensively clean. And uh, yeah, if you stop your opposition from scoring, then you obviously put a little bit of pressure on the other end. So I think that's something that we need to to look at. I would say that they remain very poor on set pieces and can be exploited. When I look at their individual numbers, uh, I would say the centre-backs are pretty good in the air. A lot of them around 60%. Uh, most of them, almost every single one of them above 50%. So Individually speaking, they're able to compete well for for uh, aerial duels. The problem, I think, is the way that they've handled set pieces before Wilder, uh, which has been very man-to-man. So they tend to go 1v1 against player, and um, they've essentially been manipulated by a lot of good sides. Arsenal did it uh, in a certain way. Liverpool used multiple differing routines and, and they were able to, to get the strongest players on the set piece. So Virgil van Dijk, I think, had three, four efforts um, in in the set piece thing with, from corners. He was basically able to head uh, at the goalkeeper, just missed one, and then eventually he got a low volley in from near the penalty spot where he was completely unmarked. So their set pieces are something that I would study, you know, very closely. They usually tend to use two zonal markers. So one near the near post, one near the far post, and all the others are basically man-to-man. So there are some ways that that, that has been exploited. Uh, an interesting way that I've seen Liverpool do it is they rush multiple attackers towards that zonal marker, and all of the man markers tend to rush there, thinking that's where the ball is going to come towards the near post. But the corner actually goes to the far post where you have your strongest aerial defender. So, um, Padi Ashley, for example, could be there, um, a good option to do that. So, if we can figure out ways to cheat that man v man system, then I think we have an in. It's, it's definitely something that I would 100% look to. 
Um, the third, I would say, is they look like they're not very familiar with pressing from the front. And this may be because, um, you know, I saw two games for Wilder and in which Ollie McBurney, who's uh, the top scorer with two goals and has one assist, he was suspended. So it may be because Osula was starting, um, it didn't look as convincing, but I would say that their pressing does need work. It looks like their attackers press one way and the midfield doesn't back it up, the defence doesn't back it up. So often the defence in the midfield line wants to stay compact and the problem there is the, the huge gap between the first and the second lines. So a lot of the times when um, they were being pressed or they were pressing against Liverpool, Liverpool were basically building up with a 2-1 kind of orientation, which is quite unfamiliar in the Premier League, where you're only using three players, like two two centre-backs and one defensive midfielder to orchestrate build-up because Sheffield United basically had just two guys. The moment they tried to push their attacking midfielder and make it a three, then they basically got Kelleher to join into the the back line and make it a 3-1. Three, three and what that did was that it freed up an extra man towards the last line or in the second line. And that's where Liverpool got a lot of joy. So if you're trying to get them to press, especially in the attacking third, I think um, there is a lot of joy for that midfielders, especially Enzo Caicedo, to cause a lot of damage with their passing. So that's something that we should definitely look to exploit. Um, I would say test their pressing. What we didn't do against Everton, you should be doing against Sheffield United and rectifying your mistake. Go to the middle third, you know, try to lure them out of their their block and try to get them to press you. They will be aggressive. That much I can assure you. And the moment they press you, try and play through. Try and go to their centre and figure out if you can cause a little bit of damage when you're running at the centre-backs. That's something we should have done against Everton. Uh, we almost managed to do a couple of times. But we didn't um, we didn't pull off the final action, and and that was poor from from us. So I think that's something that we can look to rectify. The third thing I would say is that they look extremely poor when dealing with pacey threats. So when they their defensive lapses come, it's usually out wide. So they struggle to do this against quick to, uh, quick midfielders or or quick attackers who, who are very direct and can run at you. I mentioned Jaden Bogle is actually somebody who's. Uh, a wide midfielder. He's not a defender as such. He he doesn't look like a fullback to me. So he does struggle when he's come up against uh, a lot of quicker threats. So um, exploited, hundred percent exploited. What Liverpool did was they tried switching from one side directly to whoever was wide against uh, their wing back, or they targeted the space between their back three and the wing back. So. That little pocket that opens up, that's where um, Mohamed Salah was dropping. That's where Luis Diaz was dropping. And the long balls were trying to find those guys in between. So if you can manage to do it, 100%. I think there's something to be found. Um, there's also the point that they're poor starters. They've scored no goals in the first half an hour of games and they've conceded 11. They tend to be pretty defiant when they're 1-0 up, but sorry, 1-0 down, but... Uh, if they're down by more than one goal, it's usually curtains for them. So they only have scored one and conceded 13 when the deficit has been more than one goal. So I would say score one and then score the second one extremely quickly would be ideal. And trying to get one in the first half an hour would definitely up our chances of, of winning this one. And the last point I would mention is, yeah, Jack Robinson, you know, the guy who is supposed to keep it all together, supposed to be Wilder's enforcer in central defense is missing. I don't think you'll have a better opportunity of exploiting their, their already, you know, under pressure defense. So, yeah, you know, let's let's hope that our players can exploit that. Uh, there's every opportunity you get to to run at it. And I don't think they, they are very good at defending against individual quality. So it will be a very unstable backline. I, I think it will happen. It's just interesting to see what um, he puts out. I, I don't know if he goes 3 4 one, two. I don't know if he goes 4-1-4-1, four, one, four, one, the lopsided 4-1-4-1 four, one, four, one that he used against Brentford because, you know, it got them their win. It got them a 1-0 win. They looked very good. The numbers were also good. But either way, you should be looking to, to exploit um, the little lightweight nature of that backline. I think that's where 
the match can be won. Well, we hope all of that, the exploitation of their weaknesses comes into effect in this match and Chelsea can get it done. I think a early goal or multiple early goals in the first half hour would do us all a little bit of good and bring back some of the good vibes that are currently missing when you do a bit of a vibe check on the Chelsea community. But we're going to take our last break and then we talk about how Poch might approach this match, get you a little bit of a predicted starting 11 and some score lines that we think might come to be what happens. But stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, Sam. So when we're looking at the problems for Pot to solve, I think it starts and maybe ends with the fact that there is just a continued list of injuries and worries that he has to maneuver through this minefield of player Uh, unavailability in this match and I think it probably brings up the start of the conversation with just the fact that Reese James is now out for an extended period of time there's been reports that there is some level of valuation of how do they for a more long-term solution try to address the repeat hamstring issues that he has been undergoing I mean there was a athletic um, infographic that showed the amount of times that both Ben Chilwell and Reese James have been unavailable either individually or as a pairing over the past couple of seasons. And it is quite, it's not something you want to see a ton of red on and boy, oh boy, it is a sea of red. When you look at that infographic, I think other concerns around Sanchez with the injury that he took to his knee. You had Kukurea who had a bit of an ankle issue. You don't know necessarily if Gusto or Christopher Nkunku are going to be ready. There's a lot of questions, and that's just that is just the fresh set of injuries that he's having to deal with. Not some of the long-standing issues like Romeo Lavia not necessarily being available and ready yet. So, how are you feeling? I mean, are you feeling as bad as Poch and the players and the rest of the Chelsea community when it comes to the number of players who are not available uh, week in, week out, and in this week in particular for Chelsea? I think it's maybe indicative of a longer trend. It just doesn't sit right with me that we've gone from, I think, one season under Tuchel where we had the most injuries out of any team in the top five leagues with 97. That's an absurd number. And the last season, you know, we had the same kind of issues. At times, we were struggling to put players out. Ruben Loftus-Cheek was playing central midfield for us. You know, he was third, fourth choice at that point in time behind the midfield that we had. So, if I'm looking at that trend and the way that it's gone from there to now, it's it's it defies belief why we're still having 12 injuries, 12 squad injuries with as many as five starters out regularly. I think... That's something that I'm hoping the ownership can zero in on because if your medical staff, if you're, you know, there needs to be obviously some kind of synergy between your your conditioning staff, your coaching staff, your your physical guys, as well as the physios and everybody else, you know, in the backroom staff. But that balance and making sure that that isn't damaging what it's doing to some incredible talent is going to be one of the most key indicators of our success in in the next couple of years. Availability is the best ability. So if you're not going to have your captain, your vice captain, and a lot of other promising talents like Romeo Lavia and and Christopher Nkunku consistently, then obviously there's every chance that we miss out on on the big talent, on on the big prizes, on the big opportunities. And, and we have to, we have to definitely focus on this. So I'm extremely sympathetic towards Reese. You know, he's obviously feeling this more than anybody else. Um, he's been at the club and he's given arguably more for it than 99.9% of the supporters out there. He's given it his heart. And it's very easy for, you know, us to say, why does he keep getting injured? But I remember every single person on social media was on their knees when, you know, Real Madrid were, were circling after he pocketed Vinny Jr. He could have gone anywhere he wanted, but he signed an extension because he's a Chelsea boy. So why are we going to abandon him when in, in his time of need? You know, we are 100% going to be behind him. Hopefully he comes back from it stronger. You know, it's it's 
chronic and it's hard, but you know he's he's a hardcore guy. So I'm completely convinced that once he's over this hump, he's going to come back stronger. But yes, I think we need to make it easier for him, and if that means getting surgery and sitting out for three months longer, and then extending and prolonging your career by three years. Why not? I think let's just get it done with. So I think as it relates to this match in particular, and again, we're recording this before we hear from Pochettino about full availability. We're doing some light speculation on who may be available just using the current injury trends. I would not imagine that Malo Gusto, who has not seen a minute of football since he has gone out her injury, would likely start this game. And I the reason I'm going to say that is because with, again, five matches over 14 days, we have seen over the last few matches that Pochettino is showing us, and I'm going to go off of what someone shows us versus what someone tells us, that he wants to rotate his players to try to help with some of the fitness or readiness issues that he's seeing. I think we will get the four... A four center back, back four. I think it is going to be Levi Colwell, Benoit Badia Shield, Thiago Silva, and Axel Di Sassi as your back four. I just don't see a world where a player is coming back off of a period of games or a run of games out that Pochettino is potentially going to risk, particularly now with a longer term issue and injury for Reese James. With Malagusto not having played recently, I don't think this is the match you throw him back in. I think you would want to try to get him minutes in this match if he is available because you would likely want him to start against Newcastle in the cup match in the midweek on a Tuesday, which doesn't give a ton of time for maximum recovery. And so agree, disagree, or somewhere in the middle, Sam, what are you thinking about that defense? I would agree with you. I think one thing I completely defend Poch for is his consistent insistence on the fact <laughs> that he will not play anybody who's not 100%. He's always looking to to protect his players. He's done that with Reese. I think there are some murmurs that, that some of us have heard that Christopher Ngunku thinks he's fit a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, the club and, and Poch have said, we're going to make sure that you're 110% before you even smell one minute of game time. And I absolutely rate that. I 100% you know, rate that. If you're going to be a little more cautious, if you're going to do the right kind of work and make sure that they come back 100% rather than the kind of risks that players and coaches tend to take in a extremely crowded fixture calendar where every fixture seems crucial and, and unmissable, I think common sense prevails. So I will give this to him. I think you, you're you absolutely right. Gusto has had injury issues um, and we shouldn't be throwing him back in. Not not right now. So I, it's it's easier for us to to go with maybe the four that we've settled with. A lot of people also criticize Poch for not using Badia Shield against Everton, but he had come back after, what, eight months out after yeah. a long, long layoff. And, you know, he, Poch, even if it made his team weaker, took that decision and I think long term it benefits the team rather than hurting it. So these are decisions that he hasn't explained. But I'm hoping people start to get that, you know, he cares about the players and a lot of players respect him for it. So hopefully it'll it'll pay in the longer term. But unfortunately, a lot of what we're doing is for the longer term and, and not helping a short term. And I think that's the the issue. But yeah, I think he will go with the four center backs. My issue is a lot of the tactical things I see working against Sheffield United tend to involve fullbacks, and we don't have any. So, for example, in the 8 0 against Newcastle, uh, against, yeah, against Newcastle a long, long time ago, um, what they essentially did was they used Almiron as um, a decoy to get their fullback or their wing back to come inside. And they opened up the entire flank for Kieran Trippier to arrive late in for a pass. And he was able to find a lot of space to cross in. He was able to find a lot of places to play nice balls in behind. So the fullbacks tend to cause a lot of damage. And we don't have them. Kukureya again with, um, you know, a twisted ankle. So he's also not there. So I think it just makes sense for Poch to devise an alternate route 
and maybe rely on the quality that we have to to try and figure out if you can cause damage but don't risk anything not right now i don't think we need it let's just get in kunku a couple of minutes if he's there i think that will cheer a lot of people up for beginners i'll also say between the sticks i think as long as sanchez feels good about his knee and feels like there's not a ton of discomfort i would imagine he starts over going with petrovic in a premier league start i I did think maybe a cup start for him was likely, but I, I feel as if Poch doesn't want to mess too much with the back if he can, even though there are questions about some of the distribution with Sanchez at time. The shot stopping has been pretty strong throughout the majority of the season, uh, albeit a couple of individual kind of decisions. But some of that's also maybe the self-inflicted domino effect of a bad pass or a turnover in midfield, a bad defensive misstep, and then leading to a concession. And so I feel like if he is going to have to go with the back four of four center backs, he's really hoping and would love to see Sanchez between the sticks to to be available for this match. Yeah, I think the two options for goalkeeper is Pity and Serendipity. So um, if Petrovic does get a chance, you know, there's every chance that you discover why we bought him. But like you said, the element of control to be able to put him under uh, or introduce him in the most convenient of circumstances, a cup game, a big one against uh, Newcastle, or I think we're playing Preston, aren't we, in, in the FA Cup? So sure, maybe that would be the ideal time. Yeah, yeah that would be an option to try and figure out if, you know, you can get in there. So... Ideally, if you've got Sanchez as your number one, you want him to play as many games as possible. I've not been happy. Let's just be kind and say that I've not been happy with a lot of his ball playing stuff. He's made some crucial saves, but he's also had massive brain farts, like extremely loud ones. And I'm hoping that he takes something for that and and shows us, you know, why we spent uh, money to make him our number one. I think with the lack of Senior goalkeepers out there, this is every opportunity for him to prove that he can be the long-term number one. I'm looking around Europe and uh, everyone we've been linked with or every known name is struggling on numbers, on the pitch. It's not inspiring right now, is it? it it's it's not a yeah, like... it's not. It doesn't feel like, oh, you're, you're, you really missed out on a couple of the names that were connected. You look at the mm-hmm. you know, some of the names we got connected with this summer and it's it's not been great. The, the, the performances have not been stellar. No, and, and a lot of them have like dropped off a cliff. You know, they've not done their their price tags or their legacies any any good. Ironically, the best performer, one of the best performing keepers in Europe is somebody who we let go for free, which is becoming increasingly uh, the, the trend at Chelsea. Yeah, <laughs> so Marcin Bulka has done very well, but um, I, I think he made it very clear, saying that I'm very happy at a club which gave me the faith when I needed it the most. So it doesn't look like he's moving, but a six feet, six inch tall shot stopper with good feet and good at claiming crosses. Yeah, that's that's exactly what we need. But uh, he's also had one season. So I would say hold off. Let Sanchez have, you know, a stable foundation. Let him settle in. It's one of the trickiest positions to play. So and then the moment you start giving him more clean sheets, I think the confidence with, with his feet maybe goes up. So. Um, let's hope that happens beginning with this game. And so as we kind of look forward, maybe we'll bypass the midfield for a second, but I think the attack after being stymied against Everton, he likely goes back to start with Jackson, start with Sterling, and then continues with Palmer as that three versus starting with Mudrick, uh, having Broya, and then bringing Jackson and Sterling off of the bench. I, I feel like that just makes the most sense to me. But what would you or could you try to convince me of an alternative path? Um, I don't know if he benches Palmer. I think that's... Um, I, I did suggest that he might rest bench Sterling and it happened. And I think this might be Palmer's week to, to ride it out. You know, he's maybe struggled a little bit. He started off extremely well. We all know how well he did. But I think um, it's also important to know that he's not played these many consistent PL minutes in his career ever. Like a a row of starts where he's playing this level of intensity can be tough on the legs, on the mind. And um, yeah, like you said, with a thick run of games coming in, it's just important to manage him well. We don't want to, to run him to the ground. So I think he might go out. 
I think that also sort of goes well with the fact that maybe you don't you don't feel that bad losing possession against a Sheffield United side who usually break with three people, four people at most. The counterattacks are dangerous, but um, the conversion rate is very poor, and the the quality of the players up front um, on those breaks, I, I think we can handle them. I think we can take that risk and. Like I mentioned, fullbacks tend to do a lot of issues. They they have problems defending wide. I would actually go with Mudrik on the left and, and I would go with uh, Sterling on the right. Yeah, Sterling obviously going on the side where um, they are slightly more defensively able, but uh, I think he can cause a lot of damage. They've, they've got a centre-back. If they go 4-1-4-1 four, one, four, one and, and Trusty plays there, then... Um, there's every chance that Sterling can go up against the centre back and cause some damage. So I would say go with two wingers um, and figure out if you can play the same three midfield. Um, Jackson again comes back for me. I, I wanted him to start last game. I don't think Breuer was a good chance or a good shout against uh, a profile like Everton, and he didn't do well. He had a very poor game, but I think Jackson definitely comes back in. Um, but it would definitely make sense for me to go with two wingers and see if you can cause some damage out wide. And then maybe bring on Palmer and uh, figure out if he can do some damage off the bench. And so as you make those decisions from a midfield perspective, it feels as if it's likely Caicedo, Gallagher, and Enzo is the three? Or do you feel like there's someone who's going to be dropped in in this moment to give one of them a break, potentially? I think all three of them play. I think it's a crucial game for Poch. He knows it. I think he would want to see this as the chance to make a statement. If you have to go in and go out and, and maybe grab a 3-0, 4-0 rampage win, you know, it arguably would not happen, may not happen. But if there's an opportunity to do it, then he won't get a better one than this. He definitely wants to grab it. So I think he goes with a strong side. And just looking at what is to be expected, I, I think it just makes sense to have... Gallagher at maybe 10. You want him to be there in, in advanced positions. A lot of the damage that was done was also through like runs through the middle. So I think having two guys or having Conor Gallagher there who's able to run in beyond the last line, have the freedom to do that in behind Jackson could be a good option. So yeah, I think go for it. I also forgot to mention that uh, they're tied with us as the more most ill-disciplined side. With 53 oh yellow cards, um, so um, they tend to they tend to get it wrong. They're not tactical fouls. They just yeah, they, like I said, they struggle to defend against skillful guys, against quick guys. They tend to do a lot of not necessary fouls around dangerous areas. So give them everything to work with. You know, give them give them Sterling, give them give them Sterling, give them Mudrik, give them anybody you can, and cause them as much damage as he can. I think that's the way to go. I just want Poch to put his, you know, foot to the pedal and I want him to go for this hard. I don't think there's any sense in letting us understand that we have to take it easy and play more, you know, cautiously. I think this is the last game where you do that. If you want to utilize a high-octane uh, game where you're giving it reckless abandon, this one is it. So go for it. All right, well, we've kind of come up with a starting 11 between the two of us. So with that said, Sam, if you had to do a score prediction, I'm going to take a little bit of the pressure off because I'll do one first. I, I think Sheffield just seemed to like to win or lose games. Um, if they win, it's like one nothing. Um, if they lose, it's usually um, you know, Liverpool result notwithstanding. Um, they usually lose having scored a goal. So I'm going to go with a 2-1 victory. I feel like this is the opportunity for Chelsea to rebound. It is an opportunity for Pochettino to get a little bit of the Mo momentum back for this side. But do you feel like we could see a different end result for this match? Um, I'm, I'm quite... I mean, you know, I predicted a 1-0 loss for us against Everton. So I was at my pessimistic slash realistic best and uh, <laughs> yeah i think i'm i'm feeling much better for this one i'm looking at this and saying there's every opportunity that we capitalize on individual quality uh, we are at home 
I think everybody would want to to make amends for whatever's happened in the last couple of games. Before that, we had a lot to cheer about. So it just takes one good result to turn the tide. And they will sense it. They absolutely have to get behind the side. So I think we might see 3-0. I might go with the 3-0 win. I don't think they score. Um, it'll be t- If they do, it'll be Ollie McBurney. But if they don't, um, it'll, be, it'll be 3-0 for us. Ooh, 3-0. Well, that would definitely make people very, very happy. They would certainly appreciate that. So let's see what happens for us, what happens for Chelsea, how we get on this weekend. And look, we're going to be back with a lot of previews over the next couple of weeks. We are not going to do one for the Newcastle Cup match, but Sam and I will be hard at work as we look ahead to the Wolves match, the Crystal Palace match, and the Luton matches before the end of the year. You're getting previews for all of them. So we are not taking too much time off, though a little bit of time to spend with family, friends, and loved ones. Because I know, Sam, you've got family visiting, you've got friends visiting, you've got weddings and parties to go to. So we want to make sure that we get you a little bit of time away from the football and away from Chelsea, despite the projection that maybe there is an upward trend that we will get to start to witness at this match in the weekend. So with that said, Sam, any final words, any final thoughts? No, season's greetings to everybody. I hope that uh, irrespective of what happens with Chelsea, I hope that you have an absolutely tremendous holidays and wishing all of you and your loved ones the best new year to come. So I know we're still some way off, but I'm hoping that all of the good feelings and, and goodwill and warmth start filtering in towards um, towards you like before the year ends. I think that's the best that I can give you. So God bless. Have a good one. Well, that will do it. Uh, Again, well wishes, happy holidays for uh, all who celebrate, uh, regardless what holiday you celebrate. And maybe it's just one of uh, joy and friends and family and loved ones and getting to spend time with them. But hopefully Chelsea brings you as much joy as that time does. And hopefully we are back on our next preview to celebrate a Chelsea win and some positive momentum. But until next time, you know what to do, Chelsea fans. Keep the blue flag flying high.